I'll introduce myself first. I'm Catherine Brown. I'm a parent volunteer here at Pitzer, and I've been a member of the Family Leadership Council for almost four years, which has been a really great experience that I commend to any of you who are looking for ways of peeking behind the scenes at Pitzer, getting more involved, supporting the institution and the students. It's, it's really a wonderful way to um, get to know the, the people who play a big role in our students' lives. Um, but this session is about someone other than me, of course. I want to start the session off by introducing our speaker, who is Professor David Moore. David Moore is the professor of psychology and the director of the Claremont Infant Study Center at Pitzer. He's been with the college since 1989. He has a PhD and master degree from Harvard University. His recent courses include a very heady selection here, Introduction to Psychology, Senior Research Methods, Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience, Monkey Business, colon, Controversies in Human Evolution, Seeking Human Nature, colon, The History and Science of Innateness, Cognitive Development, and Seminar in Developmental Psychology. You can see that uh, he brings a wealth of knowledge to us today. I want to thank you all for joining us for this session titled Developmental Science and the Nature Nurture Question. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Moore. Thank you very much, Catherine. I appreciate it. Um, and to those of you whose um, shining faces I can see, I appreciate that too. It's always strange to talk to little black boxes, um, but I understand some people aren't in a circumstance where they can turn on their camera and that's obviously okay. Um, one thing Catherine would not have known is that I actually have a brand new course that I just taught last semester called Minds and Machines. And that's because I've recently been involved in a project that involves uh, bringing information about developmental psychology to bear on the development of artificial intelligence. So if any of you are interested in artificial intelligence, we could talk about that during the Q&A also. Claremont Infant Study Center. And that's because my primary mode of empirical research is to work with babies. I work with kids in the roughly um, six to eight month range, and I'm interested in their perception and cognition. And that's what I've been doing for my entire career. But when you work with babies, what you see is that they develop very, very quickly. And in fact, that's why I work with babies as I'm interested in the process of development, how it is that you go from um, one state of being to another. I just got a signal that my internet is unstable and I have to apologize to anyone if I'm freezing or um, otherwise stuttering, um, but hopefully you can hear me okay. We are living in a very strange world where we interact with each other through unstable internet connection. Um, so I was saying I'm interested in the process of development um, and that's one reason why I uh, like to study infants because they're developing so quickly. Um, one of the things that I thought when I was a, a graduate student was that if you're interested in nature nurture kinds of questions, it's world without experience. And so anything that's present right at birth must be something that has been produced by evolution or by genes or some other mechanism that does not have to do with learning or experience. That turned out to be incredibly naive, but I forget because I was a student. The truth is, as you learn more about how it is that things develop, you come to realize that there are a lot of processes happening prenatally, um, whereby uh, fetuses and embryos have what amount to experiences. They have interactions with their controlled environment, namely a uterus, those environmental factors turn out to be very important in their development. And so I started looking into how it is that these uh, very, very early experiences influence development. And that led me to go back even further in time and 
what happens during conception, um, what happens immediately after conception, how does development begin to unfold in those very, very early moments. And so what I wanted to talk to you about today is some new understandings we have from molecular biology that help us get to the bottom of uh, the nature-nurture question. Green. Um, let me see here. And my hope is that you can all see that. Can everybody see the screen? Okay, good, thank you. All right, my title for today, Developmental Science and the Nature Nurture Question. Um, my apologies if um, instead of looking at you, it looks like I'm looking over here. That's because my slide presentation is on my second monitor here. And so I'm uh, sometimes referring to it. So I wanted to start off by um, the words nature and nurture uh, generally are thought to refer to that which you have independent of your experience, that's nature, and nurture is what you have um, as a result of your experiences. It's the things you learn um, and the things you encounter as you move through your life. This distinction between nature and nurture is very old. Uh, William Shakespeare even referenced the distinction. Um, in The Tempest, he wrote, a devil, a born devil, on whose nature, nurture can never stick. That was in 1611, so we're talking a very long time ago. Um, the scientists pick up, picked up on this distinction uh, pretty quickly, but before they could get to it, the philosophers got their hands on this. There were a bunch of philosophers who were interested in nature, nurture kinds of questions, including John Locke in the 17th century, who was sort of a um, uh, the penultimate, not penultimate, I'd say he's the ultimate um, nurture guy. He wrote about the blank slate, the idea being that we all come into the world without much nature and that the way we get to be how we are is mostly just through our nurture. Um, David Hume largely agreed with him. Um, on the other side of the coin was Leibniz and Kant who also in the 18th century were arguing more the nature side of things, saying that we could not possibly be who we are if all we had to rely on were our experiences. The things we come into the world with are critical. Um, this is Charles Darwin, who in 1859 wrote Origin of Species. And ever since he did that, things started to change and uh, the pendulum really swung toward nature's side. Um, he made a strong and convincing argument for the importance of evolutionary processes that I think most people started to think that a lot of the explanation for why we are how we are has to do with our genes and with our evolutionary history. Any of you guys ever hear of Francis Galton? I'm always surprised how many people don't know Galton. Um, has anybody ever heard of correlation? Of course, right? Almost everybody knows correlation. Francis Galton invented correlation, which is one reason why I think people might have heard of him, but typically no one has. And I think there's a good reason. Well, I'm bringing him up at this point because it turns out he's related to Darwin. If you look at the um, upper row here, you'll see in green, there's Erasmus Darwin. Erasmus Darwin was married twice, and he had quite a number of children, two of whom were Robert Waring Darwin and Francis um, Anne Violetta. Um, these two people had children. Um, over on the left side, we see Charles Robert Darwin, and that's Charles Darwin, who we're all familiar with, who wrote Origin of Species. Over on the far right side is Francis Galton, who turns out to be his cousin. This is Galton, and in 1883, he wrote, nature is far stronger than nurture within the limited range that I have been careful to assign the latter. And the reason he was writing this sort of thing was because, largely because of his relationship to Charles Darwin, he was very interested in the nature-nurture question and the extent to which the things that we're born with make us who we are. 
So he did a bunch of really interesting studies in the late 19th century where he looked to see the extent to which um, people who were famous, eminent was his word, um, to each other. He wanted to know if all the eminent people in England at the time were all related. It turns out that mostly they were. And he said, aha, see, it's all in the genes effectively. Now, no one had ever heard of genes at the time. That idea had not yet been developed, but he was very much a fan of nature idea, completely missing the fact that all the people who were related to each other had similar social advantages and were achieving eminence in part through their educational experiences. But he's very important in our historical story because he developed what came to be known as the twin study. The twin study is a method that he designed specifically to try to get at nature nurture questions. They already recognized by the late 19th century that identical twins were um, identical for some reason having to do with nature. Um, these days we understand that they have the identical genomes. And Galton's idea was if we have these kinds of twins and they grow up and are very similar to each other regardless of the experiences they had, that suggests that nature is more important than nurture, which was his ultimate conclusion. A story um, came with the addition of the recognition that there are also fraternal twins who share only half of their DNA. And using identical twins and fraternal twins, the thought was maybe we can begin to tease apart how much of our characteristics are caused by nature and how much are caused by nurture. This, and again, I'm getting the uh, unstable internet message. Hope you're all hanging in there with me. So Galton's ideas were taken up by a group of people known as behavioral geneticists. And um, many of these ideas were also used by um, people in my field who occupy a specific branch known as evolutionary psychology. And these are some of the people who were involved in these branches of their fields. Steven Pinker is a fairly famous public intellectual, some of you might know him, and he wrote a book called The Blank Slate, in which he specifically takes to task John Locke's idea from centuries earlier that we come into the world um, basically as blank slates and that mostly it's nurture that matters. In that, he argues the evolutionary psych perspective that much of um, why we are how we are has to do with our evolutionary history. Richard Dawkins in the upper right um, wrote a book in the 70s called The Selfish Gene. And many of you might have heard of that too because that became extremely famous. He's a zoologist, um, but has contributed in significant ways to our understanding of evolution. Uh, Robert Plowman in the middle just recently, last year, in which he basically took Galton's ideas about twins and used all of the data that have been collected in the last hundred years to argue that there is a basic blueprint that we inherited for evolutionary reasons that influences how we become who we are. I hate all this. None of this is the way I think about things. I think about things in a very different way. And the reason I do is because of all of these people. These are known as developmental systems theorists, and they argue that we are as we are not because of our genes or because of our nurture, of the two. And it's very easy to say, well, yeah, it's a little extreme to say that a particular characteristic is just genetic or a particular characteristic is just learned. Um, it's, all, it's all a mix. But even though that's easy for us to say, the truth is most people don't believe it. And I know this because I've been talking about it for decades. And in those decades, I always ask people, let's talk about eye color. Do you think that's strictly determined by genes? And almost everyone I talk to says, yeah, eye color is determined strictly by genes. And the reason people say that is because that's what they're taught in school. I'm here to tell you that it's wrong. 
You're taught that in school because it's a simplification that makes it easy to understand. And it gives us some mental shortcuts that help us make predictions about what kinds of characteristics people might have. And so it's a useful heuristic, heuristic being a sort of mental shortcut. And so schools continue to teach, but the truth is when you look at what actually causes eye color to develop in an individual, you find that it's a very complex process involving a very large number of genes. And it's a process that can also be influenced by environmental factors or experiential factors. Some of the first people that recognized that we were thinking about things in the wrong way is developmental systems theorists. Um, among the um, oldest, the, or I should say the historically earliest of the developmental systems theorists to think about things in this new way were Daniel Lehrman, um, shown in a picture here from the 1950s, and Zing Yang Kuo, um, that's a picture from the 60s. These guys argued that what we really need to do if we want to understand how it is that we wind up with the characteristics we do is look at the developmental process. And as a developmental psychologist, this has always resonated with me. And notice that this is a very different approach than the approach that the behavioral geneticists use because they can just look at twins who are adults and say, okay, are the identical twins more similar than the fraternal twin? Twins were influenced more by their nature. But no one's looking at development in that sort of study. You're just taking the adults as they are. All of the people pictured on this slide were interested in studying organisms as they change over time. And as you start looking at it in that way, you start to realize how dramatically intertwined nature and nurture are. So I want to spend the rest of our time today telling you a little bit about what we know about how nature and nurture work together. Um, the person who you saw on the upper left is Gilbert Gottlieb. Um, this was Gottlieb's conceptualization of how nature and nurture work together. He said, we have some genetic activity that can influence the activity of the neurons in our brain. Um, that's activity. And the neural activity in our brain influences our behavior, of course. And our behavior influences our environment, right? You can go over to the thermostat, turn up the heat, change your environment with your behavior. The interesting thing about Gottlieb's conception was he believed that the environment can feed back and affect our behavior. So if the environment gets too warm, you might take off your shirt to cool down. So the environment's affecting your behavior. But it turns out behavior can also affect neural activity because the way you think is affected by what you do. If you get up in the morning and you go to class, you're gonna have changes in your brain structure and function because of having learned something in that class. So your behavior affects your brain activity. He also proposed in what was really a very early suggestion that neural activity could affect genetic activity. And there was some evidence to that effect back when he made this argument in the early 90s. At this point, the data about how it is that our um, environment can influence our genetic activity, typically through neural activity, has grown dramatically. And we now know a lot about how it is that this works. And in fact, there's a whole new branch of biology called epigenetics that talks about how it is that experiences influence genetic activity. Epigenetics is a bit of a strange word. Um, it literally means on top of genetics because epi means on, on, like on the surface of. And when I first talked to my dad about this, who was a medical doctor, he was like, that makes no sense. Well, I don't understand what that means to have something on, on genes. Turns out that they're actually literally physical things on genes that can increase their activity or decrease their activity. And the discovery that these chemical factors change genetic activity has been um, a real watershed in our understanding of how nature and nurture work together. 
the upshot being that starting in around 2000, the number of references you see in books to the word epigenetics starts to shoot up dramatically. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of epigenetics, but in the uh, circles that I run in, it's become uh, quite the, the uh, all the rage, I guess we could say. Some people have called it a fad. I never want to call it that because I believe it's here to stay. Um, but it is certainly um, a very hot topic these days. Uh, can you guys see my um, cursor here? Okay, this is a chromosome, which no doubt you're all familiar with. If you just pick at the end of it and pull it out, um, you'll see that ultimately that turns into this uh, double helix that you're all probably familiar with. It's what DNA is. Um, DNA also is packaged in a specific kind of structure using these things called histones that help it fit into a cell. And it turns out that we can modify how genes do what they do by adding these things called methyl groups, these chemical structures directly onto DNA. And when you do that, that ordinarily either silences genes or quiets them down. It makes it so that they are less active. It's also possible to add some chemical groups onto these other things called histones. And that can likewise um, increase genetic activity or decrease genetic activity. One reason this has been so exciting for people is because, do you guys recognize the Weasleys? Any Harry Potter fans? Okay, these are the Weasleys. Um, one of the things that had been a mystery for a very long time is how it can be that identical twins can wind up so distinct from one another when they have identical genes. And this was a, a topic that was interesting of interest to me because um, back in high school, I had a couple friends who were identical twins and they looked a lot like each other, but no one I knew would ever have confused these two twins because once you know twins, they're often distinguishable from one another. And one question was, how is it possible that they can be each other if they have identical genes? The answer, of course, is their experiences change them in some way. And we now understand that the way in which that happens is through epigenetics. So I have some um, images here from a study that was done in uh, 2005, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And it's a complicated slide, but just to simplify it a little bit, recognize that anywhere you see yellow, you're basically seeing a similarity in the genes of identical twins. But anytime you see either red or green, you're seeing a dissimilarity between the identical twins. And what you see here on the left is that for three-year-old twins, you have genes that are mostly yellow. So they're very similar when they're very young. The 50-year-old twins still have the identical genomes they always did, but now you see a whole bunch of red and a whole bunch of green indicating that there are epigenetic changes that have occurred in the 47 years um, since they were three-year-olds. Between when you're three and when you're 50, a whole lot of nurture. You get a lot of experiences. And at this point, it's generally agreed that our experiences are what are causing these epigenetic changes. And so a lot of people now think that this is what's responsible for the differences we see in identical twins. It turns out that the differences that we see are, you know what, ordinarily I would just say, um, speak up if you have a question. And the truth is I want anybody to feel free to speak up if they have a question, but do be aware that I'm gonna leave some time at the end uh, so we can have some Q and A. And if you have a question, feel free to write it down just so you don't forget, because I want to be able to address anything that comes up. All right. Um, it turns out that the kinds of changes that we see as a result of these epigenetic phenomena are sometimes not at all subtle. So what you see here are two different flowers that if you didn't really know what you were looking at, you might think are two different species, because they look very different from each other. But in fact, these flowers are the same kind of flower. They have the same genes. And the reason they look so different from marks that are on top of their genes, 
that turn off and turn on different constellations of genes and lead to these different kinds of outcomes. This doesn't just happen in flowers, it also happens in some animals. Here are some insects, the common honeybee, and workers and queens, as some of you might know, are genetically identical. Um, all, the queen, all the bees in a given hive are clones of each other, genetically. As a result of the diet that one of them is fed, that one will become a queen. And the queen winds up looking very different than the workers. She is much bigger. She has functioning ovaries. She has a much longer lifespan. The workers have little pollen baskets on and collect pollen, queens don't. And all of these changes are the result of epigenetic phenomena because their genes are identical. Does this happen in animals like us? Well, we can get a little bit closer. These are some mice, so they're mammals. They're much more closely related to us than flowers or bees. These five mice that you see here, again, they are all identical to each other, they're clones. And in spite of the fact that they have the exact same genes, they're dramatically different in terms of their appearance. The one on the left is obese, also has health problems, uh, more likely to develop a diabetes-like condition, more likely to develop cancer. The one on the right is um, less uh, heavy, uh, dark, much healthier. The between them, epigenetics. So you can see why epigenetics has become so um, exciting to a lot of people. It seems to have dramatic influences on the characteristics we develop. And at this point, we know that there are a variety of factors that in, can influence our epigenetic states, such as diet, also drugs, um, exercise that we do, pesticides, if we're exposed to light. Um, so for instance, if you fly to a different country and you experience jet lag, the way in which you come to be adjusted again is by um, an epigenetic phenomenon. I think we briefly lost Professor Moore. I don't know if you can hear me, uh, Professor Moore, but um, you're frozen on our side. And I think he may have just gotten bumped out. So I think let's give him a chance to log back in and see if we can continue. In the meantime, if anybody has developed some questions so far, I see that we've got one question in the, the chat box. Feel free to make a note of your questions there rather than um, putting them on paper if you prefer. Um, and we'll simply make sure that Professor Moore sees that when we get to the Q&A part. And while we're waiting um, for Professor Moore too, I'd be interested if anyone feels like speaking up about another session they went to so far this weekend that was particularly interesting. No pressure, but oh, I think we're cut off anyway because I think I saw him pop back in. There you are. I'm back. I'm sorry about that. Um... You know, that's only happened once during my actual Pitzer classes. So I'm very sorry that it happened right now. Tell me, um, how long was I frozen? Maybe 45 seconds. Okay, not too long. Um, let me share Ish. my, all right. You can tell me um, where, where we were. 
You were talking, I think, about exposure to light. Okay, so you had seen this. You were talking about when we travel mm -hmm. to another country. Right, when we travel to another country, we experience jet lag. Um, yet, if you're there for a few days, you adjust. The way in which you adjust, adjust to the new time zone is because of this epigenetic process whereby exposure to light resets our biological clock. Um, seem to influence our epigenetic states. So all kinds of stuff. I am unstable again. Hopefully I won't freeze. I'm sorry, guys. Okay, um, here's some data that show that um, abuse during childhood has that the amount of methylation on specific genes changes depending on whether you have been abused as a child or not. Um, the fact that these were suicide patients is kind of irrelevant. Um, the only reason these were suicide victims is because it's very difficult to studies with human populations since you need to be able to access someone's brain and living people don't typically let scientists access their brains. So oftentimes you need to work with someone who's died. But in many cases, when people have died, we don't know how some sort of um, disease that contributed to their death might have altered their brain. But if someone has committed suicide, we usually know that we have a fairly healthy brain that we're working with. So um, really the part that matters here is the abuse versus non-abuse. And uh, this was some of the earliest evidence we had that the experiences children have when they're young can influence the epigenetic states of their brains. Well, it turns out that social environment also matters when we're adults. It's not only in our early childhood that these things matter. Um, this was a very interesting study in which these macaque monkeys were introduced one at a time into a territory. And the first monkey that's introduced to a territory basically claims that territory as their own. So when you introduce a second monkey, that monkey is not the alpha. The first is the dominant monkey and the second one is subordinate. When you introduce a third, the third one is then third down on the pecking order. And so in this way, it's possible for are in the pecking order in their troop. What makes this interesting is that you can then remove a monkey from the top of the chain and change everybody's status so that the monkey that previously was the beta now becomes the alpha. And it turns out that these genetic epigenetic changes as well, suggesting that where you rank in a social group changes how your genes are functioning. Further evidence from Steve Cole's lab at UCLA has shown that um, loneliness is a factor for human beings in terms of our epigenetic state. People who are um, very disconnected from others seem to be more at risk for a variety of um, immune system um, malfunctions. Um, their immune systems are not working as well. And he basically traced that effect to um, their epigenetic states. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about this little town in northern Sweden because it turns out that some of the experiences that we have in the course of our lifetimes have epigenetic effects that might be transmittable to subsequent generations. And this really has the biologists up in arms because um, biologists is that the things that happen to us in the course of our lifetime can't really affect our descendants. And these kinds of epigenetic phenomena suggest that that might be wrong, that it's possible perhaps that things that happen early on can affect descendants. The story in um, this town in Sweden is that in the 18th century, they were so far north that the waterways that would ordinarily allow them to be connected with civilization would freeze over. 
And so they had no way to bring in any additional food in the winter. There were no railroads, there were no roads, they were completely isolated. And so the only food that they had was the food that they had grown in the previous growing season. Now, because the King of Sweden was interested in taxing everything that every community produced, the community kept very good records about how much they produced in every growing season. And so now in the 21st century, we know which years were years of plenty and which years the population in this town were struggling with famine. And we can use those data from hundreds of years ago to look at the descendants of these people and to see if there's any relationship between their experiences hundreds of years ago and um, the experiences of the offspring. And these are some of the data. It shows that in a particular period of life, namely between about eight, uh, nine years and about 12 years, if you look at the paternal grandfathers, in years where their food intake was good and there had been a lot of food that was grown, if they um, had offspring, and those offspring then had, had offspring, you could look at the grandson's risk of mortality. And what you find is that such that if there was a lot of food in the grandparental um, era, there was um, a, uh, I'm sorry, there was a, if there was a lot of food in the grandparental era, there was a higher risk of mortality in the grandsons. And somewhat counterintuitively, less food, um, years of famine in this particular period of life when the grandfather was sexually developing, it led to a, an increased risk of mortality for the grandsons. And there was an interesting sex effect here where it was the grandfathers affecting the grandsons, not the, other, not the case that the grandmothers mattered. But the grandmothers mattered for the granddaughters. So grandmothers who in their slow growth period between about eight and 10 years, if they had a lot of food, their granddaughters were at greater risk of dying early. No one has been able to come up with a very good explanation for this kind of phenomenon other than to refer to epigenetic effects. So while we don't these chemical groups on the DNA that's causing this effect, that is the consensus of most scientists at this point. So these days, a lot of scientists think that epigenetics ought to be thought of as being at the center of modern medicine because it can be seen as a unifying principle in a variety of diseases. And for a person like me who's interested in development, one of the important takeaways here is that we need to always focus on development because a lot of our diseases or I think of um, being overweight as a disease, but still that's related to our health. And so factors like that too seem to be affected by developmental processes. So there's now a whole branch of biology called developmental origins of health and disease. Um, many people think epigenetic factors are involved in cancer. Th this paper talks about how it might influence Alzheimer's disease and other memory impairments like um, senile dementia. Some people have argued that the experiences people of different races have growing up at different um, kinds of environments can have epigenetic effects that then get transmitted to next generations. Um, there is reason to believe that addiction is influenced by epigenetic processes, that PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is influenced by epigenetics, um, child abuse, as I mentioned before, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, um, there are drugs that are now being developed to try to fight depression that seem to work by interacting with the epigenetic system about this. And it all comes from the understanding that the experiences we have are dramatically influencing what our genes are doing. And so back in the day, we used to think that 
genetic factors can be um, given credit or blame for certain characteristics that you develop. But we now understand that it's not really what genes you have because those genes can effectively be turned off in some cases by epigenetic factors. And if that's the case, then the information in the gene is kind of like a, the information on a book that's on a shelf that's never been read. The information is there, but if you're not using it, it's of no consequence. So what matters now, people are beginning to think, is not so much what genes you have, but how it is that you use your genes. So your experiences um, are, affect your epigenetics and your epigenetics affect your pathology, then your pathology can interact back with your experiences and so on. So nurture working in a way that is metaphorically captured by this Escher print. Some of you might know Escher, a great Dutch um, graphic artist. Um, this shows the different factors working alongside each other. And it's not ever really appropriate to think that one of them is more important than the other because they're both contributing in essential ways to our characteristics. So I thought I'd end with a plug for a couple of my books, both of which um, convey these kinds of ideas. The one on the right is my more recent book that talks specifically about epigenetics. Um, the earlier one, The Dependent Gene, was really about how our genetic factors are, um, depend for their functioning on environmental experiences. So uh, we do have 15 minutes for questions and um, any kinds of comments you all might have. Professor, some, some of the questions in the are in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me take these. Um, Donna asks, um, has epigenetics led to the development of functional or integrative medicine, um, taking supplements? Um, yes, although it, um, it's still somewhat um, speculative because the data, the, the entire field is new enough that there's still a lot to know. But um, one of the ways in which we get the kind of methyl group change DNA from is through our diet. And one dietary supplement that some people have been using is called SAM, S-A-M. Um, you can find it in your you know, local Whole Foods um, or other health food store. And SAM um, supplements have been implicated in alleviating some depression. Um, and most people think that that might be because of its epigenetic effects. So that's a possibility. Most of the um, solid work that's been done in this area has looked not so much at functional or integrative medicine, but at more traditional Western medicine. Is there some way we can use this information to develop drugs? And one of the problems is that the drugs that um, we have developed are fairly wide acting and it makes it very hard to find a drug that's going to cause the specific kind of effect you want it to cause. And so most of these have a variety of side effects. And so they have not been approved by the FDA for widespread use. But in some cases, it, it seems that using these kinds of drugs is worth the risk of the possible side effects. And particularly when we're talking about non-solid cancers, so cancers of the blood, um, those are cases where um, without treatment, there is risk of death. And so some people have thought it's worth um, risking exposing people to the side effects to see if these drugs these epigenetic drugs might be able to um, slow the growth of the cancer. And in fact, these trials have been so successful that the FDA has approved um, epigenetic drugs specifically for the treatment of those kinds of cancers. Okay, Catherine asked, um, suicide brain, it's healthy. Yeah, okay, so this is a good point. Um, it's not the case that a suicide brain is completely healthy. 
Um, presumably there is something different about the brains of people who commit suicide than the brains of people who don't. Um, oftentimes there is a thought that people who commit suicide don't necessarily have degenerative brain conditions. And so the thought is that their brains are better for studying than someone who, for instance, died after a bout with Alzheimer's disease. But Catherine, your point is very well taken. These really ought not be considered perfectly healthy brains. So how do loneliness and depression affect the brain? Um, in a wide variety of ways. Um, we know for sure that depression um, affects the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain that is involved in forming memories. So people who have been depressed often have a hard time remembering the things that happened while they were depressed. So, so um, I think we can um, reasonably surmise that there are a number of different changes happening in, in brains. Um, and let's see, what is known about how epigenetic changes manifest in the human body? Um, I guess I would like to hear some more about that question. Um, what did you mean by that? So what chemical things happen to cause them or what, what, what mechanically occurs in the body or what chemically occurs in the body? Okay, so um, there are a variety of ways in which this, in some cases, it seems to just be a function of the amount of certain kinds of chemicals that you eat. So methyl groups are present in a variety of foods. And if you eat them, there's more of them around. And then various proteins in your body um, put them onto genes. But there are other ways too, for instance, um, when you are traveling to a foreign country, um, you go, or even if you're just traveling across three time zones in the United States, and you find yourself in a new time zone, the light coming into your eyes sends signals back to your brain, and those signals cause a um, resetting of your biological clock. So basically what's happening is the activity in neural cells leads to the DNA inside those cells, um, changing how they are methylated or acetylated. Um, it's also the case that hormones are important. So um, we have data not from humans, but from rats. And this, there's a bunch of data that's circumstantial that suggests that what we see in rats, there are probably similar things going on in human beings. But the data in rats make it clear that as a result of the licking that rat mothers do of their rat pups. This is how rat mothers take care of their little babies. They lick them a lot. The experience of being licked releases hormones in the um, newborn rat pups. And those hormones then are able to be transported inside of cells where they cause the changes, the epigenetic changes. Um, okay. how does does environment affect eye color? Um, we don't know a whole lot about that, but my favorite example of it happening is David Bowie, who sadly left us um, five years ago. Um, David Bowie was involved in a schoolyard fight over a girl when he was a kid. Um, a friend of his punched him in the face and it changed his eye color. So if you Google pictures of Bowie, you will see that he has two different color eyes. And that was as a result of his experience. The truth is we don't understand a lot about this, but um, if you're curious, you can email me, Catherine, and I can certainly send you a paper. Oh wait, no, actually it was Eva who asked about that. Um, I can send you papers about how complex eye color determination is. And in many cases, the complexity is related to the fact that there are a very large number of genes that are contributing. So we don't have that much data on actual in environment. Hang on, I should clarify something. So when we talk about environment, oftentimes we're talking about the environment outside of our body. But when we're talking about nature and nurture, if we think of nurture as being the environment outside of our body and nature as being our genes, 
you're missing a whole lot of stuff in between, namely everything that's inside your body, but that's not genetic. There's a lot of stuff inside your body that's not genetic. It's things like um, hormones and neurotransmitters and other chemicals. And so these things constitute the environment of the gene. And so sometimes when we use the word environment, we're talking about what's outside of the body. Sometimes when we talk about environment, we're talking about the environment of the gene. And certainly it's the case that eye color is influenced by the environment of the gene. So Eva, I could send you, or Eva, however you pronounce your name, I could send you some papers on that if you're interested. Um, and Catherine asks, is there any between your epigenetic understanding and campus mental health or other programs? Um, I don't think so. Um, and the reason I don't think so is because so much of what's going on in the domain of epigenetics these days is experimental. Um, there is not a lot of understanding that um, can be applied yet. My sense is that the stuff we're learning about epigenetics mostly just um, reinforces what we all already knew, which is you should eat well, you should exercise, you should avoid a lot of recreational drugs, right? And these are all things that we really didn't need to understand the mechanism um, in order to be able to help our students understand how to maintain their mental health. So I don't think the people at, in Claremont are um, utilizing epigenetic information very much yet because it's just not mature enough. Um, and then I got a direct message from someone who, since it was a direct message, I, that person will remain nameless, asks, um, from my research, what has been my most surprising discovery? Turns out that it is unrelated to any of this. And the reason it's unrelated to any of this is because my experimental research, as I mentioned, is with babies. I'm not a biologist. And so everything I have come to know about epigenetics, genetic activity, hormones, neuroscience, it all comes from reading and studying. My empirical work, my experiments are all behavioral where I'm working with kids between the ages of about four and six months. And in my lab, we're not really doing epigenetic work. Instead, we're looking at how it is that babies come to recognize an asymmetrical object when it's viewed from a novel perspective. So I have my little um, uh, Lego pirate here, and he has one arm facing toward you and one arm facing up in the air. And when we turn him around, Right? You can see that he has a lot of different orientations. I can ask you to imagine, what would this guy look like if I turned him upside down? And you can do that in your head, right? You can imagine that before you ever actually see it. Turns out that there's a very strong sex difference in the ability to do that accurately and quickly. Um, males, for reasons no one understands, seem to be a little quicker and a little faster on average than females. And so even though everybody can do it, and even though some women are way better than some men, on average, males seem to be better than women. And I thought it would be interesting to um, study this in my lab because I thought I could show that in formality and that the reason this sex difference emerges is because of the experiences children have as they grow up. To answer the question I received, what's the most surprising discovery in my lab? Four month olds actually have this sex difference, which blew me away, distressed me. I was not happy about this, but it turns out that four month old boys are better at this than four month old girls, and we still don't know why. So we've been studying this by looking at the relationships um, between performance and our mental rotation task and things like um, hormone concentrations at birth. And it's been really interesting research. So I understand that uh, um, Zoom is automatically going to kick us off in uh, 45 seconds. So sorry we're out of time, everybody. Um, I would like to have actually met you all, been able to talk more. Well, I hope you'll all join me in saying thank you to Professor David Moore for a very interesting discussions. Yes. Thank you.
I've learned a great deal. Thank you for that. Thank you. And uh, everybody, you I hope that you much. will find additional things to attend this family weekend. Thank you all so much for being here. Enjoy.